ินอับอัตมันต์เกอร์วีฟรอมดิสปุลปิดสตาร์ทเดอะเอ่อนิวคายน์ดอฟแอนออฟเฟอริงวิชิสเอ่อคอมบิเนชันออฟด็อกทรีนัลแอนด์ซิมิด็อกทรีนัลแอนด์ปราคติคัลสับเจกต์สแอนด์เดอร์สเรียสันไวเราเริ่มทำด้วยซูอัฟเตอร์แอนด์นั่นก็คือสิ่งที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราทำแล้วก็ที่เราท And as a part of the new offering to you, in the last two Sundays we covered security of salvation. Salvation is something, or salvation is perhaps the most precious thing that we have. And the question in the hearts of many is how secure it is. From the Word of God, in the last two Sundays we noticed that salvation. Comes to each one of us as a gift of God, and the giver itself makes it secure, not like the warranties that you have, but a warranty which God gives. Your salvation is eternally secure. No one can take it or snatch it away from you once the Lord grants it to you. We also started a series on. Sanctification, which was interrupted, I had given a detailed introduction, so I will not go to a detailed introduction. But for the sake of those who are listening to this series for the first time, let me give a brief review of what we saw in the first study on sanctification. We live in a world where there is a lot of stress on practical life. And more so because in these days, Christians have a lot of interaction with non-Christians, and many of these non-Christians have a very model life, a life in which there is a lot of sacrifice, life in which there is a lot of devotion, and there is some kind of a regular tuning to God and things of God. And when we see that, many of us are in a habit of comparing. Our life with their life or theirs with us, and there is nothing wrong in comparing, provided you use the right standards. So when we compare, many of us feel that many of our non-Christian neighbors have a life which is far more devout, a life in which they show more dedication than us, and perhaps they even are more holy than us. And when people start thinking that way. Consideration of holiness. What exactly is holiness? How exactly can I have a holy life? Becomes important. Whatever the way in which you are drawn to a holy life, or drawn to a consideration of how can I be holy? Whatever the way that the fact that you are drawn is to be appreciated. And once we are drawn to a desire to lead a holy life, it is essential for each one of us to go back to the Word of God and see what the Word of God says about holiness, especially personal holiness. And as we study personal holiness of Christians, one of the first words that jumps to us from the Word of God is sanctification. And we all. I am sure that we all wonder what exactly this sanctification is. Am I sanctified? Am I sanctified to a sufficient level? Can I ever expect to reach a level of sanctification in my life that the Lord expects from me? All of these are good questions, provided we try to find the answers in the light of the Word of God. And when we look at the Word of God, especially when we look at the Concept of biblical concept of sanctification in the light of the Word of God, we immediately realize that perhaps we might be harboring some kind of uh, wrong notions about sanctification and holiness. See, in the common Christian circles, holiness is associated with something 
some some people who are out of the ordinary perhaps they are beyond our reach they are people who walk around in the society with a halo around their heads and there is no shortage of pictures in christian homes where they show where they depict saints with halos around their head and therefore this question even if you don't ask it openly the question is definitely there at the back of your head as to what happens when a person becomes holy when he becomes sanctified does he ex- does he have an out of this world experience does he have an out of this world kind of a life does he have a life where anyone who comes in contact with him is automatically sanctified do miracles suddenly start appearing around him and can we at least in a faint manner see or detect the halo around their head the question is compounded when many of us come in contact either with christians or non christians who also have a ceremonial concept of sanctification where some kind of a ceremony is used to sanctify them or to declare that they are sanctified bible also speaks of ceremonial sanctification and therefore unless we clearly read all of them and distinguish between what is what we can be confused in my last study on this class i reminded you that in the old testament we see two kinds of sanctification one is ceremonial and the other is real a ceremonial sanctification is that kind of a sanctification where someone who has been entrusted with this task maybe a high priest take something like say blood of a sacrificial animal or some kind of a holy oil and anoints a person and through that that kind of a ceremony he is declared sanctified but in the old testament itself we also see real sanctification where people become sanctified not through a ceremony but through an act or a process but the question now is what exactly is this sanctification because you may say you have been using the word sanctification separation and holiness synonymously for the last 5 minutes yes i have been using them synonymously because in the word of god terms such as sanctification and separation and holiness they are synonymous they don't mean different things they perhaps represent the different aspects of the same process when the word of god talks about holiness and when it talks about sanctification it is talking about separation separation of a person or a thing or a nation or an object from something and it is separated not only from something it is separated unto a cause we see ceremonial sanctification in the lives of the people of god in the old testament when the lord separates people and passes through them through various ceremonies but in the old testament itself we see real sanctification where god very clearly tells his people that when you go and settle among people you have to remember that you are a special kind of people and therefore do not go and mingle with people around you do not emulate their ways do not adopt their gods and goddesses do not adopt their religious practices do not embrace their philosophies do not enter into business partnership with them over and above all of these things do not enter into any kind of matrimonial alliance with that kind of people or the people around you because you are a special people chosen to be separate from the people around you a person refrains from marrying not as a symbolical gesture but as a real practice so that's a difference between symbolical sanctification and real sanctification when a high priest apply some kind of an oil on your forehead and declares you as separated or holy you are sanctified but in a ceremonial manner through a ceremony but when you as a child of god refrain from marrying a person 
who does not share the same relationship with God, that is real separation. You are following a command of the word of God to maintain a separation between you and that kind of people who do not have an intimacy or a relation with God. So in the Old Testament we see both ceremonial and real separation and the real separation comes to its climax or the, the test of real separation comes to its climax in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. I am sure that lately you had a chance to go through Nehemiah where as they were fortifying the town which was a symbolical gesture that we are separate and which was also a practical step to separate the people of God from the people around them a large number of Gentiles come and they threaten they even threaten to kill the people of God they shower the people of God with all kind of abuses. They even conspire with the people of God to eliminate the leaders who were in getting involved in this kind of a reconstruction activity because once the reconstruction is over, there will be a symbolical separation and the symbol would definitely contribute to a real separation. And tremendous is the pressure which Nehemiah and his companions had to face. But do you know, have you ever paused to check for the reason why Nehemiah had to face such a struggle? See, he was trying to preserve the integrity of his people. Why should a Gentile who has nothing to do with a Jew worry about it? Why should people like Sanballat, Tobiah and many others conspire against the leaders of Israel? Why should they worry? Because here they were minding their own business. As we read the book of Nehemiah, we notice that these Gentiles were worried because some of the leaders of the Jews had already entered into matrimonial alliance with the Gentiles and therefore now the interests of the Gentiles and Jews, they were all interlinked with each other. And since they were interlinked, any kind of separation would hurt the business and also the financial kingdom of the Gentiles. That was one reason why they were fighting so hard. This was no ceremonial separation. This was real separation, a separation which they should have maintained, but they breached it. It is some of the priests and high priests who entered into matrimonial alliance for their children with some of these abominable Gentiles around them. And things became so bad that in the temple of God where even the average Jew did not have an entry, there the priests and high priests had given some of the larger rooms to these abominable Gentiles for them to use these rooms as their storehouses. This happened repeatedly in the Old Testament where the people of God where they fail to maintain their real separation from the Gentiles. And the struggles through which the people of God went through in the book, book of Nehemiah is obvious to us. So as a person reads the first 39 books of the Bible, the ceremonial kind of sanctification and the real kind of sanctification becomes so obvious to him that no one can escape the fact that in the Old Testament the Lord had given a lot of weight to sanctification and that also he had given way to both kinds of sanctification, the ceremonial one and also the real one. But if a person had to choose only one of them, he was supposed to choose the practical sanctification because the ceremony in the Old Testament was only a shadow of things to come. And it, since it was a shadow of things to come, the shadow was only a shadow of reality and the Lord was more interested in the reality than in the shadow. The shadow was there only as a teacher. As we come to the New Testament, we notice that separation or the idea of separation or the idea of sanctification takes more of a practical nature than ceremonial. And as the New Testament church started, we notice that all Old Testament ceremonies that were meant to sanctify people, they were done away. In the New Testament, there is no more ceremony through which a person is sanctified. 
let me repeat it once again if you are under any kind of misunderstanding let me repeat in the new testament the lord has done away with all ceremonies which used to ceremonially sanctify people because those ceremonies were a forerunner or a shadow of things to come and once the reality came here there was no need for the ceremony or the symbol and now we have to live with the reality and therefore in new testament there is no ceremonial sanctification so you may say what about baptism baptism separates us into a separate category from the gentiles around us isn't it not at all the word of god doesn't say that and if you feel that baptism is a ceremony which symbolically sanctifies us i have a request here is the word of god in front of you in your own mother tongue why don't you do a little bit of homework and show those those uh, statements in the new testament which show that baptism is a ceremony for sanctifying us and i would def- i would be happy to adjust my outlook and i would be happy to recall my statement but the statement is here in the new testament we do not have any kind of ceremonial sanctification because the lord has done away with ceremony ceremonial sanctification the only two ceremonies with he has with which he has left us in the new testament are baptism and the holy communion these ceremonies in themselves do not sanctify you rather it is a bunch of sanctified people who have to partake in these ceremonies nobody else that's a new testament approach it's not sanctifying you through a ceremony but rather sanctifying you in reality and then it is only sanctified people who are supposed to partake in it and i'm sure that many of you noticed in the last 2 to 3 sundays several of the people here read from 1st corinthians chapter 11 where it says that if a person partakes of the holy communion in an unworthy manner the lord punishes him he invites punishment do you know why as long as that person is le- not leading a holy life or as long as he continues in his impurity he is compromising with his sanctification on a day to day basis and therefore since he is not sanctified on a day to day basis he is partaking unworthily that's a new testament attitude no ceremony for sanctification you should come to these two ceremonies as a sanctified person as a separated person so that much about the types of sanctification and since in the new testament we are talking about real sanctification we have to be more careful there is no person no leader no priest nobody who can come and say i pray for you i lay my hands upon you i do this for you and from hence for hence forth you are holy no that is not the way things take place in new testament new testament in in new testament things take place in a totally radical way we will be going through all the details but just let me give you the three words which are related to the real sanctification not the ceremonial the real sanctification in new testament the first word is positional sanctification the second is experiential sanctification and the third one is ultimate sanctification and the lord if the lord allows we will be going through the word of god and we would study all these three kinds of sanctifications but for time being it is sufficient to realize that when the word of god uses this word it is talking about separation and once the word of god uses this word in the new testament it is talking about a real kind of separation the people of god are separated from something unto something and now my question is have you understood that you are a bunch of sanctified people you are a group of sanctified people i'm talking only to those people who have experienced salvation can you say that yes i am a sanctified person you may say brother johnson you must be joking i am only a new believer and it would be another 30 to 40 years before i can hope to lead a normal life let alone a sanctified life another person may say yes uh, uh brother i have been fasting and praying and i have been doing everything in my power to lead a sanctified life and i was hoping that some day somehow the lord will visit me in a very special manner and from that moment onwards 
I would feel sanctified and then they would quote didn't the lord appear to sadhu sundar singh that's a statement exactly similar to the joke that i narrated to you last week i came here on a car at the speed of 60 km an hour and how old am i only an insane person can ask that kind of a question look at the history of sadhu sundar singh first of all we don't obtain or we don't derive doctrine on the basis of the experience of others but even then if you have to look at the experience of others look at the experience in the light of the word of god sadhu sundar singh claimed that he had he saw a light but that was before his salvation it has nothing to do with sanctification it had more to do with revelation some kind of some kind of not even revelation some kind of an illumination which the lord gave to sadhu sundar singh it is not any kind of divine revelation there is a difference between illumination and revelation which some of us might present here when we go into the doctrine of revelation he is not talking about any kind of post salvation experience and the word of god doesn't talk about any any kind of post salvation sanctification when the word of god talks about this subject it talks about something that happens simultaneously with your salvation oh you may say but brother i have read verses in the bible which says that you have to work on your salvation which says that you should be sanctified which says that let sanctification take place in you yes that's right the way we saw the subject of salvation the word of god or and we saw when we studied salvation we saw that the word of god talks about many aspects of salvation in the same way when the word of god talks about sanctification it talks about many aspects of sanctification the problem with us is that most of us see only one side if we love a person we often see only the good side of that person if we hate a person we see only the bad side of that person it is typically human to be one sided divine truth is not one sided divine truth is multi sided it's true that because of our limitations we are often able to see only one side and there is nothing wrong if we are able to see only one side but if we claim that ultimately there is only one aspect because i am able to see only one at a time we are wrong we saw that as we were studying the security of salvation and we have to realize that as we study this doctrine here also there is more than one aspect of that doctrine there is more than one way in which god sets us, us apart and there is more than one kind of people or group or idea or philosophy from which god sets us apart and there is more than perhaps one purpose for which he sets us apart we have to look at all of them and categorize them and as we categorize what the word of god says about sanctification we realize that the very word of god talks about at least three aspects of sanctification one a kind of separation which is given to all irrespective of his outer appearance even to the most obnoxious believers even to the most hypocritical believers even to the most carnal people oh you may say you must be joking you often pull our legs so this must be some kind of a leg pulling no this is not a leg pulling in truth the word of god labels even carnal people as sanctified and let us look at some of these verses which are going to open our eyes would you please turn with me to hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 it says by which by which will we are sanctified it is not we are being it is not we shall be it is talking about an action that has already taken place in our lives 
let me ask you even if you are not a theologian and even if you don't have a very deep background in the bible you have some idea about the people to whom this epistle to hebrews was written they were a bunch of people who were living in some kind of a rebellion i hope you remember that hebrews chapter 6 reminds us it tells us in a very painful manner that these were a bunch of christian believers from a jewish background but when there was pressure these believers rather than depending on the finished work of christ on the cross they went back to the jewish temple and they were offering sacrifices that's amazing isn't it it's somewhat similar to say a group of say muslims you go and preach the gospel to them they accept lord jesus as their personal savior they become communicant members of the church they are very happy they are being taught by some of the best bible teachers and then there is some kind of a sickness in their home and next sunday they miss church service so everybody is worried because these new believers were so full of zeal that they would not miss even a small program in the church and today they were all missing in the church service so some of the responsible people from the church go to their home and to your horror you see that one of the muslim uh, priests is sitting in front of their house and there is some kind of a fire burning and the fellow is uh, throwing all kind of uh, things into that contraption and you immediately realize that this man he is a magician or a sorcerer from a muslim background horror of horrors you go inside the house and the brother in the house the leader or the head of the house welcomes you and places a variety of dishes in front of you and he says that this morning we had a we had 3 hours of sorcery and after that our priest sanctified all these things and he offered it and if we all consume it our child would surely become holy surely become whole and you say brother i was under the impression that the moment you accepted lord jesus as your personal savior you left all these pagan practices and particularly your indulgence in demonic practices and he says come on brother when a man is facing a struggle he goes from pillar to post for some kind of a relief i have not deliberately gone see my child is sick my only child is sick if anything happens to him i would not be able to bear the psychological trauma and more so with my wife brother i am going only from pillar to post i am not abandoning my christian faith what would be your response i would be shocked i would say to myself that man it is impossible to believe impossible that also a person a new believer who was discipled in my church for the last one year or the last 5 years something like this in his life is impossible to believe perhaps we failed in our task and then you come back your wife wants to know everything you are not in the habit of sharing such things with your wife but that day you burst open and say ki this is what i saw and your wife says simple achain you don't know your theology that fellow is not even saved that is why he has gone back to all these rituals all these demonic practices i tell you take it from me my grandpa used to tell that if you are really born again you will never go back to and you forget all the theology that you studied in the last 30 years and you embrace the theology of his her grandpa in 5 minutes and in the next business meeting in the church there is a big discussion about brother rahmat khan who came to the christian fold 5 years ago and who is indulging in witchcraft and sorcery and all of you come to a conclusion that perhaps that's because he was not sanctified properly he did not set apart somebody says he did not repent properly somebody says he did not have a real experience of this and that brothers and sisters and my dear children 
I took a little time to, ex to illustrate this to you so that you may realize the gravity of situation there gravity of situation in the church to which the spirit of God sent this letter they were a bunch of Jews they had abandoned everything they had accepted Lord Jesus as their personal savior and for perhaps for the last 20 years they were taught the word of God and discipled by some of the best people the church has seen some of the greatest apostles some of the greatest teachers some of the mightiest preachers they were discipled for almost 20 years and suddenly one day there is an outbreak of persecution by the Jews and lo Rabbi Mikhail Yusuf is back in the temple offering sacrifices exactly the way he used to do 20 years ago before the moment of his salvation what would be your theory oh you would say he i am sure that though he accepted the lord he did not repent properly he did not separate himself properly he did not do this he did not do that what does the word of god say the question is what does the word of god say the word of god says we are sanctified by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ and that also did you notice the last phrase once for all so this bunch of men and women who after about 20 years of faithful Christian life abandon some of the fundamentals and go back into something that has now become an abomination for the new Christians they are embracing it and the word of God says that we are all people who are sanctified and that also not once but once and for all brothers and sisters you have to realize in the light of what the word of God says that once a person accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as his or her personal savior at the moment of your salvation you are set apart you are sanctified and that also not for a moment you are sanctified once and for all or you may say well that is only one quotation from the word of God just for the sake of uh, clarity and also for the sake for the sake of assurance would you be able to give at least one more reference from the word of God oh yes not one I can give you many but that one comes here would you please turn with me to 1st Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11 1st Corinthians 6 11 a little background before we turn to 1st Corinthians 11 who were Corinthians the Corinthians before their salvation were some of the most rotten people wine woman and song was their way of life immorality was part of their moral system and debauchery was part of their ethical system it was a way of their life from them the Lord in a miraculous manner brought out a large bunch of people they became believers in Christ but then very soon they started having problems there were ecclesiastical problems some of them were fighting with each other I belong to Paul I belong to Peter I belong to this I belong to that so there was ecclesiastical fight then there was jealousy and malice then there were people who were show-offs they would come and show off in churches and during the first generation or the first century of first century church usually their church meetings it is estimated that they started in the morning and went on perhaps till night that is the way it happens in many churches even today in Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu in Kerala also a hundred years ago Many of the church services, especially among the brethren and Pentecostal, 
they used to start at 9 o'clock and would last up to 2 or even 3 in the afternoon. Everyone sitting there glued to the word of God without anybody thinking of getting up and going. But that kind of an occasion was used by some for a very vulgar display of their wealth. Naturally, if you sit from the morning till night, you are hungry. So there were sessions when people would take their tiffin out, tiffins out and have food. So some of them would eat and drink and become intoxicated and some of their brothers and sisters, they would go hungry. They were even embarrassed to come to the church. That was the situation in Corinth. So there was every kind of sin among the Corinthians. If you would turn to chapter 3, you would find another kind of sin. Go to chapter 5 and you would find that there were some people who were indulging in sexual immorality which is of the most serious and of the most deplorable kind. Incest. And the Spirit of God says that incest of such a kind which even Gentiles among you detest. The Gentiles who are steeped in all kind of immorality even they detest. That is a bunch of, that is a kind of Christians you are. But the same Spirit of God when it speaks to that group of people about sanctification, says in chapter 6, verse 11, And such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified. Did you notice that? You probably thought that a person has to walk around with a halo before he can be declared sanctified isn't it it would be good if we have halos because that would help each one of us to recognize each other better and respect each other better but that's not the way the lord works the lord works in ways which are often incomprehensible to us and the first part of sanctification is definitely incomprehensible to an average believer where a, where a bunch of Jews who 20 years after accepting Lord Jesus as their personal savior go back and embrace all those things which they had abandoned. And the word of God, the spirit of God says you are a bunch of sanctified people. We come to Corinth where you see people that are totally degenerate and rotten in every possible way. And the Spirit of God says that in Christ you are sanctified. And as though to rub salt into your wounds, that means the wounds of those people who think that they are not sanctified. In Hebrews the Spirit of God says that you are sanctified once and forever. That hurts a lot of people. Especially those who feel that sanctification should lead to a life which is only holy. Sanctification should lead to a life where should not see anything that is wrong in the life of a person. It also hurts those people who say that salvation is something that is to be kept by our hard work. Otherwise it can be lost. And once they come to Hebrews and they read the Spirit of God saying, speaking to this bunch of people that you are sanctified and that also you are set apart, you are holy and that also not not for a moment, but once and for all. That becomes a disturbing thought for many of these people. It becomes disturbing because they do not understand the various aspects of salvation. They are not able to see the biblical picture in a clear manner. Right from the beginning of this series of studies, we have to understand that Many subjects mentioned in the word of God have more than one aspect, more than one side. And unless you are willing to see all those sides, your perception is terribly short-sighted and you are going to move into error. When you look at the doctrine of salvation, look at all aspects. Take all verses into consideration, not your pet verses. And when you take all verses into consideration, then perhaps a clearer picture would emerge. In the same way, when you look at sanctification, 
Don't look at the subject based upon your preconceived notions. Don't look at the subject based upon your pagan philosophies, which many of us have inherited from either our background or from the background of some teacher who has been indoctrinating you for the last decade or more. When we look at this subject from a biblical perspective, we notice number of things, the first one of which is that every person, irrespective of his present state of life, whether he is a hypocrite, whether he is a person who has gone back to his earlier faith, whether he is a person who is terribly immoral, if he once accepted Lord Jesus as his personal saviour, then in front of God, he stands as a sanctified child of God. It doesn't have to depress you. It doesn't have to be a depressing thought to you. When you realize that this brother or sister who has been leading such a rotten life for the last 10 years in your church or in your family, this brother or sister who after his salvation and after a brief period of a very zealous life who has been leading his life with the dogs in a wretched manner when you when you are told that in the lord he is as sanctified as you are you don't have to be depressed you don't have to be upset if you are willing to look at the other sides of sanctification of sanctification also the aspect about which we have been talking so far can easily be termed as positional sanctification. The word of God talks about many kinds of positions which the Lord has given us. For example, we all know that we are all children of God, isn't it? John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 11 and 12 are known to all of you, which remind us that if any person accepts Lord Jesus as his personal saviour, God has given him the right to become God's children that is a position given to us at the moment of our salvation we became God's children many of us perhaps do not exhibit characteristics of God's children in our lives and after we study the lives of many of our fellow believers for five minutes it becomes very difficult to believe that a child of God can behave in this manner and it also becomes difficult to believe that if a child of God behaves in this manner, it becomes difficult to accept that it is a tremendous position. But then you have to separate position from practice. That is what the word of God says and that is what we see in our day-to-day -day life. At the moment of your salvation, you are made a child of God. That is a position given to you. But children do not always behave in a proper manner. The best example from the word of God itself is the parable of the prodigal son. He was a child. But did he behave like a child? No. Did the, did the elder, behave, elder brother behave like a child? Did he behave in a proper manner? No. Both of them were sons, but they did not behave like sons. Going to history from the word of God, you know about the twelve children of Jacob. One of them was sold into slavery because he had seen a dream. He had not invented a story. My dear brothers and sisters, it was not an invention of his mind. It was a dream through which the Lord himself had communicated to him the way in which he is going to be elevated on a future date. What about his elder brothers? They were elder. And as older brothers, they had an estate to keep. They had a position to keep. Did they keep the position? No, not at all. Instead of behaving as a protector for the young Joseph, they behaved as butchers. Some of them definitely wanted Joseph killed. One or two perhaps did not want that. But most of them wanted him to be eliminated in any possible way. And understanding that the elder brother, the eldest one said, let us not take his life. Let us sell him off. He was better than the others. 
but as a group of people they did not behave like children of a patriarch they did not behave like children of god remember they were not only the children of jacob they were also children of god they were going to become fathers of the 12 tribes of israel they had a position they had a position now they had a position which they were going to acquire in future but they did not behave in keeping with their position so the word of god itself gives us plenty of examples where a person is given a position he is expected to behave according to his status and position where he is expected to conform to the position to which he is called but he fails to do so in our secular life also we see that my young friends you often see this i am sure that when you go and study in schools and colleges you see a number of teachers who are the epitome of love and compassion and care i left my school 32 years ago but even 32 years after that i keep in touch with some of my teachers they were like a father and a mother unto me but do you think that you had only that kind of teachers no you had other kinds of teachers also isn't it did you ever come under the spell of a malicious teacher yes you did i am sure i came under the spell of a malicious teacher and she saw to it that in those subjects in which i was taught i always was placed at the bottom just passing marks she had a position biblically speaking she was in place of my parents do you know that biblically speaking the position of a teacher is in loco parentis in place of parents but she was a hindu and according to the philosophy which they taught us every morning guru was brahma vishnu shiva and even para brahmam she had that position to keep according to her philosophy but for the 3 years that i spent under her she dealt with me in the most ruthless manner oh you may say johnson uncle might have taken his revenge upon her no no not at all that was that's not given to us revenge belongs to the lord you may say perhaps johnson his uncle is upset that she ruined his career no she was not able to ruin my career i want to tell you i did not take revenge i am not asking you to take revenge on such teachers i am not implying that such teachers can ruin your career nobody can ruin your destiny because your destiny is in god's hands the way the brothers were not able to touch joseph and all their malicious activities only contributed to his elevation to the position where god wanted him to go in the same way what your teachers what your cousins what your uncles what your aunts do to you they are only going to contribute okay that aspect should be clear to you what i am saying is in your life in your student life i am sure that you have met at least one teacher who did not keep his or her estate who behaved with you in a manner that was not in keeping with the position given to that teacher whatever the profession whatever the call there will always be some people who definitely want the position who enjoy all the privileges of the position but who do not keep their estate who do not behave in a manner that conforms to their position it's the same way in the christian life god has given us a position and that position which the lord has given us includes at least 40 things he has made us his children sons and daughters he has made us his ambassadors he has made us royal people he has made us royal priests he has made us kings he has made us ambassadors he has made us many things he has also made us his representatives as a peace keeping force here in this earth he has also made us a salt of the earth the universal flavoring agent he has made us the light of the world 
which brings darkness into the lights of millions of people who are groping in darkness that's our position sanctification as we looked at it today starts with a possession at the moment of your salvation the lord took you united you with lord jesus christ made you the same body and sanctified you first corinthians chapter 12 13 speaks about an important aspect of what the lord did to you at the moment of your salvation first corinthians chapter 12 verse 13 says for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be jews or gentiles whether we be bond or free and have been made to drink into one spirit by one spirit we have been baptized we have been identified into one body what is that body the body of christ the son of god the eternal god as we were identified as we were united with the body of christ just as lord jesus christ is set apart we were also set apart the quotation from hebrews where the spirit of god says that these legalistic christians were sanctified the quotation from first corinthians where we see that these carnal christians these profane christians they were sanctified in christ it is talking about the position given to us at the moment of our salvation and when the word of god says that we were sanctified or set apart once and for all it is talking about our position in christ it is not talking about experience there is a vast difference between position and experience as i illustrated from the experience of joseph and his brothers and also from the experience of the prodigal son brothers and sisters as we study the subject of sanctification we will see more biblical references related to experiential sanctification but before we come to that definitely take a little time to assess or evaluate your own thoughts about sanctification all these years have you been confusing between positional and experiential sanctification in your vocabulary perhaps you did not distinguish between them you did not know the difference between them you did not know that sanctification is to be seen in its various stages or in various classes and therefore you were confused and all these years you perhaps thought look at that brother look at that sister look at that young man what a life i wish i could have that life like that perhaps i am not holy perhaps i am not sanctified and when the word of god talks about sanctification that's perhaps because i i am not able to lead that kind of a life because i am not sanctified like that last year around this time i heard about two people who passed away at unexpected stages in their life one was a young believer hardly 28 years old he was a charming young man the life of the congregation a model for all young brothers and sisters in that church i had a privilege to minister in that church and his name was still on their lips he died before he he touched 30 but everyone in that church acknowledged that this brother was a model he was a model of not only maturity he was a model of sanctification it was shocking that the lord took away this kind of a person so early in his life but when we look at bible we know that lord works in 
mysterious ways he has his own plans but what shocked me more was the death of a 5 year 5 year old child which was reported to me 5 plus he accepted lord jesus as his personal savior when he was barely 5 and after his salvation he had only few months to live but when he died even the senior most people in the church stood up and said that though he was not six he ran a race he completed the course he went away but he left an impact upon us not even six such life's challenges they are people who touched very high levels of spiritual separation in their lives when we hear about such people it is natural for us to think will i ever be able to reach that state we also read about great people such as sadhu sundar singh pandit arama bai narayan vaman tilak they were great christians i am sure some of you have heard about u m dore raj you should know about him he was my sunday school teacher he went to rajasthan as a missionary he went to a very hard area alwar as a pioneer missionary he worked there for many years he did not see many converts he always grieved about that but he kept on working in that place today there is a very vibrant assembly and a very vibrant bible school in that place but dore raj was not able to see that he was there only to sow the seeds because according to the best of what the evidence that we have because anti christian elements took him away and murdered him he was the first modern martyr from the brethren church when we look at the lives of these people whether dore raj or sadhu sundar singh or pandita rama bai or narayan vaman tilak or some of these great indian statesmen or the lives of young young people who had a modern life and who passed away we are amazed at the intimacy they had with the lord we also are amazed at the sanctification they demonstrated in their lives and therefore often when we struggle with our own weaknesses we are distressed oh lord would i ever be able to reach that state and in that anxiety we forget that our sanctification has at least three parts the first one given to you and me as a gift never 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 to be revoked never to be taken away and that is your position in christ and according to that position when the lord looks at you he looks at you as a child a child of god who has been set apart who has been taken away who is now sanctified who is now holy the world encourages you to work hard and then get the position many of you have college degrees you have to work for a minimum of 3 years before you got your first degree isn't it some of you had to struggle a little more anyone who has a college degree had to struggle first and get their degree after that but there's a little difference in the christian life in the christian life the lord gives you the position first and then you study for it in fact in one of the theological seminaries there was even a very serious proposal that once a person is admitted for his bachelor of theology the first thing the seminary should do is give him his doctorate make him a dd doctor of divinity and then let him study it was said in as a joke but there was a little truth behind that 
the lord operates in ways which look totally different from the way man operates the human society forces you to work and once you attain it gives you a certificate for that attainment god takes you gives you everything that you did not deserve along with that he gives you a position and then he says my child now you have a whole life and now you have to conform to that position i have made my grace available to you on a day to day basis so that you may start living according to your position and therefore my dear brothers and sisters if you have ever struggled with the idea of sanctification holiness separation then first of all be assured from the word of god that god has already given it to you he has already made you a saint you don't have to be canonized he has already made you an ambassador he has already made you holy he has already sanctified you now he after your sanctification gives you a span of a decade or perhaps many decades during which appropriating all the grace that is available from him you should try to lead a life that is in keeping with the status that is given to you so the next time you are distressed about your sanctification you have to remind yourself i am already sanctified the lord has already done that to me now my responsibility is not to be distressed not to be distressed about about whether i am sanctified or not my responsibility is to look at my own life look at all the provisions which the lord has made for me and then appropriate the grace to lead this life through saint paul the holy spirit says not that i have reached not that i have attained nobody can say that i have attained not that i have attained but forgetting the things in the past i press on towards the mark that is the way in which christian life is to be lived and therefore before you leave this auditorium you should once again assure yourself that if you are a child of god if you have had the experience of salvation you are a sanctified person and the lord gives you all the tools that are necessary now for you to lead a sanctified life and it is now your responsibility not to be distressed but rather to appropriate the grace that is available so that in your day to day life you are able to show that sanctification but before i close if there is anyone here who has not yet come to that moment where he or she can stand up and boldly claim that i am a child of god then i have a request please don't leave the confines of this auditorium before making sure that you are a child of god there are any number of us in this congregation men women children who can stand up and tell you yes uncle yes aunty there was a moment of time in my life when i accepted lord jesus as my personal savior and since that time i have the assurance from the word of god that i am a child of god i received that assurance when i was a child when my father shared these things with me and there itself i knelt and accepted lord jesus as my personal savior if you have not experienced that in your life please don't leave this hall without consulting someone who is willing to share and explain these things to you if you leave this hall without experiencing this you are rejecting god's free offer of salvation and you are also playing with your destiny don't do that seek help there are many here who would be more than happy to help you to guide you and lead you into the experience of salvation if the lord grants us one more sunday we will be looking at other aspects of salvation sanctification particularly the experiential aspects 
and we would also be looking at some of the factors which hinder sanctification because such factors have become too common in our day to day lives may the lord help each one of us to understand the significance of these things and may the lord help each one of us to understand that christian life is opposite to secular life in secular life you struggle first attain later in christian life the attainment is given to you and then grace is also given to you so that you try to keep the estate that was given to you let us bow our heads in a moment of closing prayer after which there will be announcement and a final closing if needed heavenly father we thank you and praise you for this very special opportunity and we pray that you may help each one of us to understand the doctrine of sanctification and we pray that you may help each one of us also to lead a life in conformity with the position that you have granted us because we thankfully ask all these things in the most exalted name of our lord and savior jesus christ